You're listening to the Bill Kelly Podcast. Here's your host, Bill Kelly. And welcome. This is the Bill Kelly Podcast. Serious discussions, important discussions for serious matters that are happening right around our country and here in our communities as well. Uh, Our special guest today is somebody who's been doing this for a long, long time and uh, covering especially uh, the federal and provincial political scene for the uh, Toronto Star up in Parliament Hill and certainly at uh, Queen's Park. And a good friend, too. He is uh, Richard Brennan, known as the Badger, among uh, those in the press galleries for his insistence on digging and finding the real story behind the story. Always a pleasure, Badger, to have you on the program. Thanks so much for being with us today. Bill, I'm happy to be here. Uh, as, as we're kind of getting our footing on this, the times are, are, are changing, as they say in the old Bob Dylan song. Uh, especially today, in, in, just to, for context here, for the sake of, our, of those who are watching the podcast, uh, this is the first day back for uh, the federal politicians, of course, after their break. And... Uh, <laughs> They talk about going into a firestorm of controversy. Uh, the prime minister is getting calls, and we're told uh, an awful lot of people, even within his caucus right now, are saying, listen, uh, Justin, it's time to step aside and uh, take that walk in the snow. He uh, refuses to do so. Uh, how can you operate in a situation like this? It's bad enough and you know that the opposition parties are on your back about this, but when your own members are talking and apparently you know, behind his back, uh, where's the leadership and how can you be a leader in, in a caucus that is not necessarily revolting, but certainly doesn't seem to have faith in their leader? Well, no, he, he's got, he's got to make a decision, you know, okay. I'm tell everybody I'm sticking no matter what I'm going for it. Well, that's all well and good, but you could take the party down with you. And we've seen that in Ontario. Hmm. Uh, he, and he just, he has to, the Liberal government, a lot of people believe, and, and, and I'm, I'm included, has over-promised and over-delivered, or under-delivered, I should say. And, you know, that's a problem. And people are starting to sink into people's minds now that what these govern, you know, what this particular government, the Liberal government under, it, it's, uh, under Trudeau is, they've made all kinds of promises, but we've never seen them come to fruition. And people are saying, well, what, what about the, you know, the different programs you've, you've announced? So he's got that going for, and he's got this revolt. I don't know how big it is, but the point is people, if I was a backbench liberal MP, I would be very concerned that this guy's going to drive the bus right off the road. Why is it though? And it's got to come from the PMO, the Prime Minister's Office itself, that seems to derail these sorts of things. And anybody who seems, uh, even behind closed doors, I guess, uh, to speak out against his policies or his concepts, uh, seems to get blown out. Anita Anand is, is a great example of that. She took over a, 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 a shitty portfolio, of course, when she was handed defense. Uh, yeah. This is, of course, with the military and the sexual assault allegations that were going on, the lack of spending that was going on. She comes up with a game plan and says, this is what it's going to take, this is what we're going to do. She gets booted out. I mean, she's still in cabinet, but it's a lesser position. David Lametti, the same sort of thing with bail reform and a couple of other things as justice minister, and he's out on his ear right now. It, it, it's, it, it's as if the, the prime minister is saying, look, just... Let's just do everything at a snail's pace or not do it at all. And anybody that wants to show any aggressive attitude towards dealing with some of these problems, get shut it aside. He does not brook, uh, how can I put it, anybody that disagrees, any disagreement. We've seen that in the past. And when you get to that point, Bill, we've always seen it in the workplace. Not we've seen it in the government. When you're no longer listening to anybody, that you think you know it all and that you're in touch with it, with, with what's going on across the country, then you're, you're in a jackpot. And that's where he finds himself right now. The polls are, you know, are terrible. They're, they drop like a stone. And, and Mr. Polyev is high right now in the polls, but that, you know, that could change. Mm-hmm. I mean, the election's not for a while, but it doesn't look good for him. And I think, quite frankly, he has he has to shoulder a lot of this discontent across the country. It's him personally. People have just basically he's run out of steam, and he's run out he's running out of support. And people are just saying, you know, his time's come. Sayonara. 
and, and we know that look at me, just about every politician, whether it's Justin Trudeau, Stephen Harper, I mean, go down the list. Uh, the, the, there's a best before date, and you're right. Actually, people just kind of get tired of them and say, "Okay, you know, it's it's time to move on here." But that doesn't necessarily mean that that has to happen. I mean, we've seen politicians, and you've covered them for years, uh, on the federal scene especially, that can not necessarily reinvent themselves, but they can pivot and say, okay, I, I know this is what we've been doing, but we're going to switch over here because this is what is going to be necessary here. He he seems incapable of that. He's not he's not a stupid person. Uh, he's he's a very good politician when it comes to campaigning and promising. And uh, But at some point, as you say, he's got to deliver. And maybe the best example of that is this this relatively new policy i was going to use that in quotation marks here in air quotes uh about you know the the, the way they're going to try to improve things for the housing affordability they they promised that two years ago now all of a sudden when their backs are against the wall they introduce it and people are saying what took you so long you know i've lost my house or i've had to renegotiate my mortgage now and i'm getting the shit kicked out of me and where were you two years ago if I don't know if you've ever lived in Ottawa, Bill, but I did, and mm -hmm. it, it's 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 a big hot house, you know, politics there, and it's it's like a big bubble, and I swear that people forget what's happening in the rest of the country and how people are trying are struggling and trying to make ends meet. People are trying to find housing. People are living in in tents and in trailers and you know in mobile homes because they can't find a place to live. Does he realize it? Maybe he does, but he certainly doesn't give the impression that he does. And like you said, this housing policy is almost a little too you know, late, quite frankly. Because, yeah. I mean, people are waiting for stuff to happen two years ago. Not now, when, when you think that it might, you know, uh, garner some votes for you. It's, it's again, it's, he's under-delivering. But he's got time, and, and maybe that's part of the problem here. More, more often than not, and you've been writing about this for years on the, on the federal scene, when you've got a minority government like we do now, uh, there's usually some pressure there to say, look, I've got to deliver here, or they're going to pull the plug on me. But he's got this deal with the NDP right now, and, and the political circumstances that, that you and I have been talking about for the last couple of years right now really, I think, are giving him a, a, a comfort level that, that he shouldn't have in situations like this. He knows Jagmeet Singh's not going to pull the plug on this because if, if the conservatives win the next election, Jagmeet Singh is, is, is out the door too. I mean, he's probably still going to get reelected, but he will have zero influence on a conservative federal government, and he knows that. So these guys are going to play out the string right now. Now, and that's that's the circumstance, and that may, that may suck, and a lot of people may not like that. But that gives Trudeau an opportunity to say, I can write this ship. i got 18 more months before we have to go to the polls. Let's get aggressive about this. And they don't seem to ever want to do that. Well, he has Jag Jagman Singh, Singh right now on his side. Mm -hmm. That could change. That could change on a dime, particularly if he's getting pressure from within, from his own party, and they're saying, you know, I, I think we've we've hung around too long with this guy. Let's let's ditch him. And and that could hap that could happen. I know I know that they're you know that their influence will basically disappear. But I, if the polls, for example, if they suddenly show that Singh is get, is, is in an upswing and he's becoming more popular, and that you know that could happen easily could happen. He could, he could, he could say this. This agreement is null and void, done. So, so a lot depends on what, how long he's prepared to, to support Trudeau and and to you know to, you know, or is he prepared to kick the slats out? There, there was mixed reaction. I, I don't want to go too deep into the history here, but during the pandemic, uh, I, I know. Obviously, the conservatives were, were, you know, on Trudeau's back for spending way too much money on on serving some of the other assistance programs. But I think, in hindsight, an awful lot of people are looking at that and saying, you know what, it was the right thing to do. And and even some of our conservative friends, uh, pundits and, and and columnists, seem to be on that page. That okay, the problem they've got is it went on too long. 
Uh, and, and there's an argument to be made that for that as well. So it's, it's not as if this guy screwed up everything. He just doesn't seem to know how to apply programs, when to stop them and, and to put sunset clauses on them. So that's, that's an element that, that he's going to have to live with. And I guess we're going to have to live with, but at some point, as you say, people are going to start looking at the track record and say, okay, what's he done since 2015? Uh, you know, you look at the stuff that we're dealing with right now with sky high prices, uh, for houses. Uh, and now we're talking about, well, you know, cost of living and that includes groceries, but the stuff that he comes up with as possible solutions to this though, Badger, I just, they're, they're seemingly inconsequential. I mean, he's, he's once again, summoning the grocery store leaders to come into Ottawa and to talk about this. Really? I mean, what are they going to do is, is Gaylon Weston going to say, all right, you got us. Uh, you know, we, we, yeah, we've been screwing people around for years now, and, and you finally caught us on it, so we're sorry, and we're going to drop prices tomorrow. It's not going to happen. I said to my wife when this came out, I said, this isn't going to amount to hell of beans. What, what control does he have over the private sector and how the grocery stores behave themselves? I, you know, he can bluster all he wants, but if the, the grocery stores could tell him to go pound sand, and what can he do about it? Nothing. Yeah, exactly. Nothing. I mean, they, they, they've talked about all these other elements that they're going to do, and they're going to try to put pressure on, on home builders, and they're going to try to put pressure on grocery store owners. Eventually, uh, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a master economist to say they're just that, that extra pressure or those fines or whatever it is that are going to be imposed are simply going to be passed down to the consumer. Yeah, yeah, it, we're going to tax them. Oh, okay, yeah, they won't pass that on down to us. No way! Yeah, they'll just they'll just absorb it right. That's not going to happen. It's just it's it's all you know. I hate to agree with Paulie on you know, almost anything, but uh, <laughs> I agree with him today. He said, you know, this is just this is just political theater. It's all it is. Well, and then you let's let's talk a little bit about Mr. Polyev. As we you've been talking about with us over the last number of months here, uh, they are rife with cash. I mean, people are getting so pissed off with the, the current government that they're throwing money at the conservatives right now, and they're using some of that now. We've seen the the ad campaign. We've seen the new and improved Polyev. You know, no glasses, no tie, a uh, little less brill cream now. So he's he's you know he's a new man. Uh, but it's the same sort of stuff that he's coming out with. He's winning this thing by default at this stage. When you look at the contests and, and the popularity polls and the polling that's being done by all uh, of the major pollsters in this country right now, it seemingly is, is that it's not that they like Polyev. It's just they, they detest Trudeau so much that they'll go ahead and take this and, and say, look at, yeah, let's give these other guys a chance. And that's a very dangerous thing to happen in an election, isn't it? When, when po people say, uh, I just want that party out. I don't care who else we put in there. And we've seen that happen before in Ontario. We've seen it happen on a broader scale here on federal politics too. And it rarely works out. Well, some people would argue it's happening right now in Ontario. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they, they wanted the liberals gone and they were prepared to grab whoever they could to replace them. It's, it, it's, I think the voters are going to have a tough time when it comes to the next election, trying to decide who they want. Uh, you know, uh, Paulie has a wolf in wolf's clothing as far as I'm concerned. But, like you said, they've, they've got this, they've got this burr under their saddle with about Trudeau. And I don't know if that's ever going to change. Uh, they're so, I, like you said, detest Trudeau. Well, it's, it's coming darn close to that. People just want him gone. And it's not just people out west, believe me. It's people in Ontario, too. They just said, you know, we've had enough. You know, he he brought his sunny ways or didn't. And it's time to move along. But in a circumstance like that, and I, I, I'm always going to hearken back to, I guess it was the early 1990s here in Ontario, uh, when they were just fed up and, and you get into the election uh, where David Peterson was in, in power at that time, the Liberal uh, Premier. And and I remember talking to our listeners uh, when I was doing the radio show at that time. Okay, who, you know, who are you going to vote for? And they just said, you know what, I was sick and tired of Peterson. He was kind of arrogant. Why even call this election? Uh, they, you know, they, they didn't want to go back to the PCs in Ontario because you know, they've been there for 43 years and they've had enough of that too. And they said, we're going to vote NDP. And I said, well, well just, we got, just for a change, for the sake of a change. 
uh, just put a new face in there. And I see the same thing happening on the federal scene. Now, the vote's not today. It's not even in the near future, I would think, according to what uh, Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Singh are saying. But that attitude it can be toxic when people are simply saying, I don't care who we put in there, just not that guy anymore. And you don't know what you're going to get. And then, you know, a few months down the road, they're saying, well, we don't like this person either. Yeah. So where do you go? Yeah, it's it, politics. Is, it's, so it's a funny place right now. You know, we, we with Mr. Pauly, I was getting lots of pressure from the religious right and the and the, the the loony right to adopt all kinds of crazy programs and and uh, all that all that kind of thing. He, you know, the, as we well know, a lot of people have read about you know some of the things that they want him. Mr. Polyev to implement, uh, to his credit, he's saying he's not bound by any, uh, anything that it might be cooked up by the, you know, by the, uh, by the supporters and members of the party. But that's easier said than done. You can say, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not tied to what they do, but I'll tell you right now, if you don't do what they want done, you're good. There's going to be a lot of heat, and you might be a you might be a one term wonder, because these people have that long memories. Well, let's look at that, and and you know the convention that the conservatives just had in Quebec City a week or so ago, uh, there were some resolutions that were passed from the floor there that uh, should I think raise some concerns with an awful lot of people, uh, and Polly, as you said, has simply said, well, I'm not bound to do that. He didn't say he's not going to do them. Uh, and one of them, of course, was they basically said, look, enough of this affirmative action crap, okay? It's, it's terrible. It's, it's, we, that's something that we're going to get rid of. Uh, basically, do they understand the gravity of that, of, of making a statement like that, the implications of that? We're talking about equal pay for, uh, for equal work. Uh, we're talking about, uh, gender, uh, equality and things of this nature. And basically, with that one phrase saying, get rid of all that stuff, they're basically saying, let's go back to the 1940s. And is that really what we want here in Canada? Uh, you know, I'll give you a practical example of it. Uh, you know, the, the women's national soccer team uh, went on strike because they're not making enough money, because the government and the, and the soccer associations not giving them enough money. If you scrap things like affirmative action, the people are just going to turn their backs and say, well, that's, that's just the way it is, ladies. Too bad. Uh, I, is that where we're going right now? Are you going to revert to that sort of an attitude and that kind of a mindset? Well, the, the, those, the people that supported, you know, supported that, are, you know, they're the, they're the kind of people that look back and think the 50s was just wonderful. You know, that, that kind of, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, the wives should be at home, you know, they should be working in the kitchen and, you know, the father should be, you know, the breadwinner and all that nonsense. Uh, but they, they truly believe that kind of stuff. And, and that's what's frightening to me. And it, like you say, Mr. Polyev said he wouldn't do it. Uh, but we'll see. I, I, I think what, you know, people should be concerned about what he really stands for. Does he, does he behind the scenes really believe in what the members of the party are saying? Or does he have a more progressive look at things? We don't know. But, you know, I mean, but again, like you said, the election's not for a while. So, you know, there's campaigning to be done and and uh, we might find out that, yeah, he, he, he is, a, you know, a progressive. But boy, I tell you, right now, I haven't seen anything to suggest that. Well, and that's part of the problem is exactly who is this guy? Uh, was it the Abacus poll that was released just a couple of days ago talked about? And they've got like a 15 point lead of, over the liberals on a national basis anyway. And and Polyev's approval ratings have gone up, although, you know, some people are questioning, is it really that he's gone up that high or are they just getting more tired of Trudeau? Uh, but it was interesting about the advocates data. They said also a good number of the people that said, yeah, let's, it's, it's time for Polyev to, to, to take the, the corner office now, don't even know his name. They thought his first name was Paul. Uh, not, not Pierre. I mean, so they don't really know him. They don't understand what he's all about. They just say he's not Justin Trudeau. And, and that, that's a little scary when that's what people are going to use as a criteria to try to make a uh, decision as to where they're going to vote. What's he all about? Uh, but we, and we've seen this happen. Anytime, Badger, that a politician gravitates towards a particular group, 
uh, and in this case, as you say, it's the extreme right wing, uh, they're going to feel as if they're beholden to them. And that group is going to say, hey, we own you. And, and we saw that happen with Doug Ford when he got elected the first time here in Ontario. Uh, he, of course, uh, you know, played footsie with the, the, the Christian right and the extreme right. Uh, and some of those elements. And, and that led to, first of all, the, 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 the sex education problems with the province of Ontario and the Ministry of Education. Uh, they wanted to throw that out. They had their own set of criterion and like, and, and, and he had to back down on that. Uh, but at the same time, you have to ask yourself, okay, are we going to see a repeat of that? And, and who's going to be, you know, is it, is this going to be the tail wagging the dog? It, Bill, it's the policies that are brought in. Uh, by a particular government, whatever stripe that might be, people don't realize that these policies, to try and undo them once you get into power, are, it is not easy. Their governments are still wrestling, uh, municipal governments and, and otherwise, are still wrestling with policies that the Harris government brought in. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and he hasn't been around for a while to... 20 years or, or more. Uh, so you, what people should be concerned about is the, the whack jobs out there in influencing policy that, it, that are implemented. And there, there it is for all to have to put up with when one way or another. And maybe the next government will try and get rid of it, but it's not as easy as that. Well, that's as good a, a segue as I think we're going to find here because I want to switch into provincial politics and, and, and this whole concept about, you know, being influenced by certain groups or certain individuals, uh, is certainly at play here in the province of Ontario right now. Uh, we know that, that, you know, the government, whatever government it's going to be, uh, you know, we can have the liberals with the gas plant scandal and, and, and a number of different things are going on. Uh, they all create their own shitstorm from time to time. And, and a lot of the time they can kind of w w wiggle their way out of this. Uh, but the, the issue here with the green belt and, and Doug Ford here in Ontario, uh, is something that has come to light a few months ago right now. A lot of people th were always wary of some of these policies and thought there was something going on like this. But there's a mil, a, a building, uh, body of evidence right now, Badger, that's suggesting, look, this has been going on for quite some time. And and you've seen the articles in the Star and in some of the other newspapers, uh, not so much in some of the the right leaning newspapers right now, uh, that this has been happening since day one. This is not just about the green belt. This is about the Ford government's attitude. It's a matter of okay, uh, who's just the last one that leave the envelope here on the table with the money in it, and uh, and they're the ones that are going to dictate policy. And it's it's kind of scary. Well, it is. Uh, it's it's scary in a number of ways that. To think, and we're talking about the green belt here, and but it, this goes beyond the green belt, and 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 let's face it, you just have to read the newspapers to see all the letters to the editor, mm -hmm. decrying what's going on with the green belt, and and his playing footsies with developers and that. But I'll just read you a little quote from in today's Star. It's an op-ed, and it's somebody quoting uh, Abraham Lincoln. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. And I would suggest Ford has been nothing but a blunt instrument. He's got that majority, and he's been w willing to hammer anybody that gets in his way. I have not in my career of 40-plus years seen anything like what I'm seeing now with this very public display of contempt for the public. And in the fact that he will not even contemplate taking a serious look or, or rejigging or actually turning back the decision on the green belt. He just, he's got the majority. He's saying, I have a majority. I'll do what I want. And that's that in the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think is going to be the factor that does him a great deal of political damage. Now, he, he's in a majority government, as we've said, and there's not going to be an election. I mean, this guy's not going to resign. He's not going to step down because of public pressure. Uh, every politician that finds themselves in this position invariably thinks that's going to blow over. 
Uh, it hasn't. Uh, it didn't dissipate during the summer months when they're not even there because because of some great investigative reporting by the Star from Global and 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 Narwhal and other uh, people that are covering Queens Park right now. They're digging up more crap on this. It's it's not going away. It's getting deeper and deeper. And it it talks about a, I guess a mindset really, uh, Richard, that of of how this government approaches problems right now, and and it's I think caused people. To start reflecting and say, wait a second, let's let's go back and see just how this guy has governed in the first place. And and now you've seen the chronology in in so many different articles that are being written right now. Yeah, this is the guy that wanted to put his buddy in as the OPP commissioner, uh, so he changed the rules so the guy would qualify. This is the guy that right in the middle of a municipal election told Toronto City Council, "I'm cutting you guys in half. There's a, a lot of you, there's no more jobs here." And that was really, that was a vindictive attitude. I mean, there was, there was no argument about, I think this is going to make for a, a more effective council. He was just pissed off at a bunch of people that treated him and his brother poorly, and he got back at them by simply saying, I've just fired you. And, and you know, don't forget, he, you know, they, they came with an uh, iron fist and told him, minister, or not, political, or, no, sorry, excuse me, provincial employees that they were going to be held a 1% increase. Yeah. And and that went to the courts, and that was you know thrown out because you could it violated all you know contractual agreements, and it, it goes it on and on and on where, again the blunt instrument, we can you know try don't try and negotiate, you just tell people what you're going to do, and that's it, whether they like it or not. But there's a mindset here that the the Ford people and and those you know who who were fans of his I guess they're not just voted for him but I mean I guess the, the handlers here tried to say no 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 Doug Doug is a good guy he's a, he's a nice guy he's a compassionate guy uh, but the the track record here seems to to, to justify just the opposite uh, that he can be very cold hearted and and ideological and i haven't got a problem with politicians that want to gravitate to that sort of thing but it, when it becomes the driving force on what you want to do uh and there's this this i i, I guess characterization that a lot of people have about the, the ontario pcs especially uh being anti-environmentalists and in and, and, and you know when he first of course got into office through the cap and trade program that uh, kathleen winner put in place bam he, he he challenged that he challenged the federal government's authority when it came to climate action plans and went all the way to the supreme court 30 million dollars of taxpayers money he spent he lost and he appealed that and cost us even more money uh, and it just seems as if what's going on here is he's simply using this, as you say, as, as a, a sledgehammer to try to drive his, his political ideology, especially when it comes to environmental issues. And that has has been verified by the fact that now we've found that some of these mandate letters uh, have been uncovered uh, through freedom of information. And that was the, th the theme, basically, to, to the environment minister and to other people that just got cabinet jobs, is get the hell out of the way. We're going to build what we want with who we want, where we want, and damn the environment. We just don't give a damn anymore. Well, he said it all in that, uh, that, that, that video that was uncovered prior you know, to him winning his first election, yeah. where he said he promised developers that they, he would let them go at the green belt and they would divide it up. And, of course, he denied it and said, oh, I'm sorry, I'd never do that. And then, of course, he, he changed his mind again. It, it, quite frankly, is appalling what we're seeing in terms of the green belt. You, like I say, you just have to look at the papers. They're filled every day with letters to the editor decrying what he's doing. It, it, it's unconscionable that he's going to take that land and give it away to his his developer pals and they'll make up to eight more than eight billion dollars on doing so when he was told by his own committee there was enough land available to build housing on without touching the green belt and he completely ignored it uh, his own handpick committee, Tim Hudak, of course, the former leader of the yes. PCs uh, here in Ontario, was on that committee. And I, I had Tim on the show dozens of times talking about housing issues and housing crisis because uh, he, he works for the real estate board now. Uh, and, and again, to simply take the advice and toss it out and saying that doesn't apply to us, uh, who's he listening to? I think that answer to that question is pretty clear these days, isn't it? Well, yeah. You just have to see some of the stories that have been uncovered 
just recently about people making money, uh, actually going and lobbying the government on behalf of these developers, and you know, then back backroom deals, telling actually telling developers which lands are going to be available, and they should they should probably buy that up, or it will be available in the future. <laughs> People have called it corrupt. Now, that might not sit well with a lot of people, but it certainly stinks to high heaven. And that stench is not going to leave him. Well, let's, let's talk about some of this stuff. Now, I know, you know, the, some of the, the supporters are going to say, look, you know, nothing's been proven in court. There have been no charges laid. Well, okay, I get that. And, and they may never be. Uh, you know, we talked about the gas plant scandal with the Liberals and the McGinney government just a little while ago. Uh, a police investigation did lead to charges. You wrote about that extensively at the time. Uh, and somebody had to walk the plank for that. It certainly wasn't the Premier, though. Uh, in this situation, yeah, it's unethical. I, I think not too many people can argue against that. But it's it's at the, the, the lowest common denominator here of, of corruption because of the stories that they have not denied yet that a bunch of very, very wealthy people uh, went to Doug Ford's daughter's uh, stag and doe and eventually to the wedding, and they all came with big, thick envelopes that they left there. And you know damn well what the result was, because these guys, of the 13 parcels that they opened up in the Greenbelt, I think 11 of them went to these developer friends that attended the, the Ford's family parties and for the wedding and, and the stag and do. Connecting those dots, how can you turn your back on that and say that this is the way politics is supposed to run? Well, it isn't, and like I say, this will be this will this will be the straw. I I believe that will you know eventually be you know be the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of the government. I know that they probably think it's not. It's people will forget about it, and you know we can do whatever we want. People got short memories, and we'll we'll butter them up when it comes to election time. I'm not so sure that's going to work. I really believe that this is the spaghetti that sticks on the wall because it's it people we're losing 300 acres a day in Ontario of farmland. 300 acres a day and this is only going to contribute to that and people are saying whoa particularly in Hamilton their Hamilton Council is very upset over that and they're thinking to, that they're going to try to take it to court or do whatever they have to to try and stop this. God bless them. I don't know if they can or not. But there's that kind of anger that he has, you know, has thrown, uh, he has not understood that it's out there and it's anger that's not going to dissipate. But, well, he's got a group of people that he listens to, and and they're basically, you know, yeah, you're right, Mr. Premier, you got this whole thing nailed. Uh, it's it's easy, I guess, to govern when you simply ignore any dissenting voices and simply surround yourself with people that are going to support you no matter what you do. And we saw that happen just a couple of weeks ago with Ford Fest, which which, by the way, in and of itself really pisses me off here's here's the premier of the province of ontario it's named after his family i mean it's 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 a love-in basically uh so we can get together and, and and these people can tell him what a wonderful guy he is but at that last one uh that he was uh, attending he actually announced that the government was actually going to donate land uh for housing and he was going to build this is what the premier says build a whole bunch of houses that are only going to go for five hundred thousand dollars and they're going to have a backyard and they're going to have finished basements so you can rent them out uh in other words everything that, that we probably need he's going to deliver all of this stuff now first of all that five hundred thousand dollars is is less than half of of the the price of of housing and, and real estate in the gtha here right now so i don't know how the hell he's going to do that uh, and how people are actually going to make any money from this, but, uh, and how he's going to deliver on that. I mean, it, I know it, your head just goes boom, yeah. like, uh, but the crowd cheered. They think, what a great premier this is. It's not going to happen. Since when was $500,000 affordable housing? Yeah, I know. I know housing going for a million dollars, but the people that are right now are struggling to pay their rent, how are they going to afford five hundred thousand dollars? Where are they going to get the money? It's just not there. It's 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 you know, you ask a politician, 
what 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 do you consider affordable housing? And you'll get a different answer from each one of them. But I certainly haven't heard anything from uh, Mr. Ford or his acolytes uh, to, to suggest that their idea is of affordable housing is anything close to what I would consider affordable. Well, and we've got people in tents uh, right across the province. It's not just in Hamilton and Toronto. It's happening in London. It's happening in just about every city in, in, in this province right now. Does he really think that this, and first of all, I don't think it's ever going to happen, but this ridiculous idea and this ridiculous promise about building houses for $500,000, meaning somebody from one of those tents is going to simply be able to walk out of there and, and into a $500,000 house, that's not the answer to the problem. It, it just, I think, reeks again of the idea that this guy just doesn't get it. He doesn't understand the crisis. Well, somebody said in the paper today, you know, he's, you know, he's a, he was born on third base, and he thought he hit a triple. You know, <laughs> he uh, he, just, he came from you know his dad had a good company, and he took it over. And uh, I don't know about a silver spoon in his mouth, but it's certainly he he hasn't wanted for much in his life, Bill. I'll tell you that much. And I don't think he has much empathy for anybody that doesn't see the world as he does. Well, and now we're kind of circling back to the federal situation. I mean, because the same accusations have been made against Justin Trudeau, and I think there's there's a, there's a commonality here between he and Doug Ford. Not politically, certainly not. Not philo philosophically, not. But they just don't get it. And I'm not suggesting that that you know if if you didn't you know rise from poverty to make something of yourself, you shouldn't even run for public office. Lots of wealthy people have run for public office and attained public office and done some great work in that. But if you don't get out of the ivory tower every now and then and go and talk to people and get an understanding as to what they're going on this is what happens as a result you just don't get the problem so how can you if you don't understand the problem you're not going to be able to find a solution to it you know, we just have to look at the fact that um, whether he sees the world maybe through uh, the eyes of their ordinary folk but we're told that he's sitting on 22 billion dollars that's unallocated. Twenty-two billion. Now, if it's true, and that's what the you know financial uh, officer said in, in Ontario, we got a we got a healthcare system. I know people don't want to hear this, but it's if it isn't circling in the drain, it almost is. We had two thousand people die last year, waiting for surgeries. Two thousand. We had a. Another 9,400 patients died waiting for MRIs and CT scans. And he's feathering the nest of developers while this is going on under his watch. I don't think people are going to soon forget, forget his legacy. Well... And again, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. You know, the next provincial election is not for a long, long time. And we don't even know who's the, the leader of the Liberal Party going to be at the end of this year, too. So, And that, that's that's all going to be factored into this. But it's a matter of, at this time, where we are right now, uh, you're looking to this government. I don't care if you like Doug Ford or you like the Conservative Party. They're the ones that are in the corner office of Queen's Park. They're the ones that are making decisions. And every time that the heat gets turned up, uh, Doug Ford responds to it, and, and oftentimes he does the mea culpa. He did that when, you know, when he wanted his, his friend Taverner to be the OPP commissioner. It was, mind you, it was Taverner that backed down. It wasn't the premier. Uh, but with some of the other policies, I mean, you know, your, your former colleagues at the Star, I think, uh, told us during the last campaign 38 times that Doug Ford and his then municipal affairs and housing minister said, we're not going to touch the green belt. 38 different times. Then turned around and he's done just the opposite. So this is this is a guy that when he feels it, uh, he'll back down. But then he's got his bulldogs. Uh, he, you know, he he you know Steve Clark gets booted out. He got shoved. You know, he says he's stepping down. He, you know, the, he got shown the door. That's pretty obvious. But Paul Calandra comes in there. And he's, he's the bulldog. He's the one that took over, of course, the, the long-term care facilities. And, and that's just as much of a mess as it ever was. And he basically comes back in and says, yeah, we're going to review the green belt now, all of these policies, but it might mean that we're going to actually end up opening up more to the green belt for these people. Uh, you know, he sounds, he's basically saying, I don't give a damn what you want. I don't give a damn about the environmental policies. I don't give a damn about the feedback. We are going to do what these developers want us to do, and that's all there is to it because, you know, money talks in this province now. It's, it's the fact they're so unapologetic 
about the whole thing. That's what really, I guess, rankles people. They just, like you said, they just, they're, we're going to do it. We don't care if you like it or not. And that, that coming from a government in, in such a blatant, you know, bald faced way, I think that Ontarians aren't used to that. And I don't believe that they'll ever get used to it because they believe that they have a say in the way the province is run, not just a party because they get a, get a, a majority government. You know, we're talking, you know, whether people like, I think a lot of people like the Conservative Party in Ontario, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure they like the Doug Ford Party. And, and that, I, that's, that's, going to, that's going to be a real test come the next election, like you say, in 18 months, whether people want to go back to the progressive conservative roots or whether they, they want to, you know, follow the likes of Doug Ford. Is there a progressive conservative party in Ontario right now, or is it just the Ford party? I think there's, there's certainly progressive conservatives left. Yeah. Uh, they may not be there. There, I, I think there's some in the, in the, certainly in that government. I don't think they're all, you know, uh, right wing lunatics. I, it, it's people, people at the end of the day, Bill, they just want you to mind the store. They don't want you doing like he's doing with, the, you know, uh, with, with the green belt or previous governments have done on the gas plants or, Things that just don't make sense to them. They just want you to run the province, give people health care, you know, get as you know, many roofs over people's heads as possible and uh, and have a great, you know, and have a very good and acceptable uh, education system. That's what they want. They don't want all this other nonsense. And that's what governments, I think, today don't understand, that people want you to mind the store and don't do anything stupid. At what point, though, did politics get taken over by ideology? Uh, to a certain extent, you know, I, I can go back to the Common Sense Revolution, that little, you know, like Mao's book, you know, that, that Mike Harris had, the little blue book it was in that case. Uh, and there was a different set there. I mean, you know, you know that poor people are you know, only have themselves to blame for the circumstance that they're in. Remember, he 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 just essentially eliminated uh, a, a number of uh, social assistance programs the minute he took office. And and I'm not sure it was the first time that happened, but it's we've seen it happen federally and provincially, not just here in Ontario, but just about every other province that's had a change of government. Is they're guided by ideology. And and I listen. I don't give a damn what political affiliation you have. You're liberal, NDP, Green Party, conservative, whatever the case might be. The concern for people seems to be secondary now to the ideology, and and we're seeing that happen with Doug Ford now. Certainly, he's got a problem. He doesn't think the environment is a key issue, and he made that clear with the mandate letters. It's no bloody wonder he tried to hide those for the last two years uh, because of the content of them. He basically was saying, "Screw the environment. I don't give a shit." And and that was going to be the the direction for all the ministers, and he's doing the same thing with so many other things. Where are the where are the 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 Bill Davis conservatives, the John Robarts conservatives, uh, the John Tory conservatives, frankly, who I I think yeah these these people are all conservative, small c conservative people, uh, but they understand that there has to be a a concern and a humanity to to what they're doing. That seems to be lost now. Bill, it's when you start to cater to certain vocal groups within your party or within within society and and forget that there's a greater good to be done for everybody in the province not just the religious right not just developers you know not not the you know the screaming lefties from the other side there's a people are out there that are just trying to go about their lives put food on the table send their kids to university if they can afford it. They don't want you pandering to these various groups. They want you to look after everybody. And that's where they, I think this government and other governments, just not theirs, have failed because they've been listening to, you know, the, the squeaky wheel rather than thinking what's best for the province. But they justify it 
by by basically saying we're doing what's right for the province. And Danielle Smith's doing the same thing in Alberta right now, uh, as Doug Ford had did when he got elected here in Ontario. And and they're saying, well, you know, we're not going to be affected by by these pressure groups. You know, the environmentalists, the the lefties that Kathleen Wynne seemed to to pay homage to. No, they're not. But they've got their own squeaky wheel that they're listening to, and it's people with money. You know, it, 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 we're going to buy the green belt. That's essentially what they're going to do. We're going to buy this government's influence to go and build a highway where we don't really need a highway. Uh, and and these are the sorts of things that are being influenced. It's 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 like they 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 decry any other party that seems to be influenced by you know, lobbyists and and influencers of any description. Yet they've got their own. And it's just a matter, okay, what team are you going to go on here right now? And they're not governing for the sake of the people. They're governing to try to uh, e essentially move that agenda forward with that group. Uh, you know, the argument of gets uh, after the, the Auditor General's report and the Integrity Commissioner's report uh, about how Ford handled uh, the situation with the Green Bell, the, 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 the supporters and some of our friends, colleagues in the media, are among that group of supporters that still think Ford's not doing anything wrong, saying he didn't benefit from that. Oh, no, he didn't, but his party did. Uh, the Conservative Party got tons of money from these people uh, that they used, that they're using right now to try to advertise to tell how wonderful they are. Yes, they benefited from that, and that's supposed to be against the rules. Well, his family benefited from when everybody came out stuffed envelopes at that uh, wedding and the buck and doe. I would say he might not have benefited directly, but somebody in his family did. Yep. So, you know, it's... The RCMP are still looking at this, and I'm with you. I don't think it's going to amount to hell of beans, quite frankly, Bill, on that. But they're still looking at it. God bless them. They may, they may decide to lay some kind of charge. I'm not sure what that charge would be. It'd be, you know, maybe similar to what was happened in Ottawa. But they're, they're think they're going to get away with it. And I'm not so quite not quite so sure, Bill, that they are going to get away with it. They haven't in the past. The courts have smacked them how many times now and said what you're doing is, you know, you, this bully boy routine of yours isn't going to work. And maybe, just maybe, the, the, ND, or the RCMP will say, hey, yeah, we're going to lay some charges here, and here's the reason why. Boy, but as we saw with the gas plant scandal uh, with the McGinty government, a, a, an underling usually falls on their sword for it. Uh, who was it? McGinty's chief of staff or something said, it was all my fault. I, I orchestrated the whole thing. And you get canned. And Trudeau did the same thing with his chief of staff uh, with the, the Jody wilson Raybalt situation a couple of uh, years ago. Uh, they always find somebody like that and try to take the heat for it. And, and, and you know, they, they end up, you know, going off into the netherworld, the political netherworld for about six or eight months. And then they get an appointment someplace else and they're fine. And the same thing may well happen here. I don't know. But I, I, I know we're just about, I want to wrap this up. But I mean, at some point, you've got to say, okay, where's the responsibility and the accountability here? And uh, it seems as if it's, the, the 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 mindset here is well it's not it's it's like that classic line that's always misused and misquoted uh from Shakespeare let's kill all the lawyers and they think ah that's because lawyers are assholes and no it, read the play get the story of, of, of what Shakespeare was writing about he said let's kill all the lawyers because the lawyers are the ones that bring sanity and and rules and guardrails to society and if you get rid of them then there are no guardrails this was said in, in the play by a guy that wanted to take over the throne and what's the best way to do that get rid of those who who defend the law and and that's what's happening here and that's what Ford's done here in Ontario you know, he's going after all these issues. He wants to build whatever the hell he wants, wherever he wants, and, you know, be damned with what it does to, to the ecosystem or, or, or to our, our environmental concerns right now. So what's he done? He got rid of the guardrails. Conservation authorities, boom, you have no power. Uh, you know, municipal governments, you have no power over any of this stuff anymore. I'm going to put this shit where I want, and you guys can't do a damn thing about it. That seems to be their attitude here. The other thing, Bill, before we go is that... The fact that they want us to believe that some underling orchestrated this entire mm -hmm. uh, divvying up of the green belt. What drives me nuts is that they think we're all idiots. That we, we swallow this and, and oh yeah, it was that guy that did, not the premier. You, you I think it was a, a former, um, oh, I, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, a senior person in the Ontario government 
said just the other day, nothing of the nature of what they've done would be done without the Premier's okay. That's the way government works. Those kind of things didn't, you know, those policies didn't happen overnight. And they would not not be done without his personal knowledge. Yeah, and and, and we know that any government's like that. It, it, it's, it's even if he doesn't know, and I, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, you're still responsible for it. Yeah. You know, you're the premier, and if it happened under your watch and you were too dumb to know what was going on, then shame on you. If you knew what was going on and encouraged it, then you know, double shame on you. And and that seems to be what's happening here. Uh, we'll see, as you say, what the RCMP are going to do about this. We've got a lot more to talk about on, on upcoming shows on this. Uh, Badger, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for this. Uh, I'll, we've got to get you back here on a regular basis and, and shine the light on some of these problems. Really appreciate the time today. Okay, Bill, thanks again. Good seeing you again. Take care. Richard Brennan, the Badger, and this is the Bill Kelly Podcast, critical discussions about our critical times. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Rebecca Wizens and her team at Wizens Law. Rebecca Wizens is a 20-time winner of the Hamilton Reader's Choice Awards for their exceptional client care and legal practice specializing in personal injury, car accidents, accidental falls, and Wilson Estates. Now, if you or a loved one have been seriously injured, or if you want to make sure that your family is taken care of for the future with the will and powers of attorney, call Rebecca Wizens, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. When life happens, you can rely on Rebecca Wizens and Wizens Law. And trust me, Rebecca is my wife. I don't know what I'd do without her. That's Wizens Law, 905-522-1102 for a free consultation. Subscribe to my Substack for timely news updates and commentary straight to your inbox. Let's keep the conversation going. I'd love to hear your thoughts on today's episode. Let me know what you think we should be talking about next by contacting me through my website at www.billkelly.co. Thanks for tuning in. This is Bill Kelly. Till next time, you take care.